Hello, friends. Welcome back to the cabin. My name is Tim Martin with Covenant Creation on YouTube. I have waited to do this video for almost six months now since I first received this brand new book. Today, I finally get to do a review of Everything is Temple by Maurice Rogers, How We Live in God's New Heavens and Earth Today. That book is available from Amazon.com. I think there are probably eight to 10 reviews on it right now. If you'd like to read some other perspectives on the book, but here's my perspective. Heads up. This is 400 pages of deliciousness. Now I read a lot of books and not just eschatology books, but every once in a while you get one that shocks you. It honestly surprises you when you realize that no, no, you're not just plain crazy. Somebody else out there, unbeknownst to you, is actually thinking about this stuff while they're reading the Bible. What's more, they put what they have learned together right in front of you in one complete package. And I was pleasantly surprised by everything is temple. 2024 has shaped up to be an exciting and productive year for Preterist contributions. Big conferences, little conferences, new books, YouTube content for outreach, and ongoing plans. Preterism is thriving even in the midst of some challenges. And I also believe some historic events took place in 2024. This book is historic for reasons that I will get to uh, in a moment, but I'll, it'll probably take some time for it to manifest its true significance but I believe it's just a matter of time before this will be recognized as a monumental accomplishment that it truly is. So let me start with special thanks to Maurice Rogers. And I really need to actually have Maurice Rogers on the channel here and do an interview with him to talk about it. That's an idea I'm working on and I'm talking to Maurice now. We're setting that up. Hopefully that'll happen soon. But while we're waiting for Maurice to join us, let's take a look. Well, I got my copy in July, just a couple weeks after the release. And unfortunately, summer is a crazy busy time for my seasonal family business and farm responsibilities here in Montana. But within five minutes of surveying it, I knew that this would be special. I ended up using a number of citations from Maurice's book in my conference presentation at the August 2024 Ask the Pastor Conference in St. Louis, Missouri. My present presentation was titled, Clothed by God, A New Paradigm for Child Rearing in the Kingdom. And it was great timing to receive this book just a few weeks before that event that was hosted by Steve Magua in St. Louis. Well, Maurice lives on the island of St. Vincent in the Caribbean. He is on YouTube at the New Cosmos Videocast and online at ChristHasAlready.com. Links in the description. He has an ongoing video series explaining Genesis 1 and 2 and the garden scene in covenant context with the ancient Near East. It's archived as its own playlist here on at Covenant Creation on YouTube for easy access if you're interested. But the book from Amazon is marvelous. And it is clear to me that Maurice has been studying both issues of Genesis creation and fulfilled eschatology in depth. To give you a demonstration of what everything is temple has already accomplished, in my view, um, is that it integrates re related topics into a relevant and readable way. Think of these three books, all blended and reformulated into one simple, easy to read treatment. So let's say these three books are three different uh treatments that are each helpful in their own way, but slightly different. But imagine if they were all melted together into one flowing, coherent book. That's what Maurice has accomplished with Everything is Temple. So first, it reminds me of this book by G.K. Beale, The Temple and the Church's Mission, which is about cosmic temple theology in the Bible. I recommend this one highly, but it's fairly involved with the scholarship but prepare to invest some time into that one, but it is worth, worth the time. 
Uh, next, you'll see a lot of similarities to John Walton's The Lost World of Genesis 1. When it comes to the de temple dedication text perspective of Genesis chapter 1, Maurice works from both the covenant context and the ancient Near East cultural context, which are clearly related. But that book is easy to read, powerful, and very, very popular on the current scene of Genesis scholarship today. There are over a thousand ratings for it on Amazon.com, and you can find literally hundreds of book reviews online. It's a very influential, uh, it's a very trailblazing type of work if you're if you're into that. Uh, I actually have a brief sort of miniature review of John Walton's The Lost World of Genesis 1 on this channel in a in a video called Is Covenant Creation Just Plain Crazy? Um, link in the description if you want to see that. But, um, you know, that, uh, that book is very, very important, and you'll see the connections to Maurice's work. Next, to round it all out, off, Maurice incorporates covenant eschatology that brings preterism in, like David Chilton's masterpiece, The Days of Vengeance. You can actually find David Chilton's book free online. I'll put a link in the description. These three books boil it all down into one readable volume that will challenge you. And ta-da, you have everything as temple. But here's the key. Maurice works out the meaning of temple context from Genesis 1-1 forward. It is not an eschatology that is arbitrarily added to the last chapter of the Bible or the last chapter of a theology book disconnected with all that came before in the biblical narrative. No, this is where it all starts. Everything is temple. Everything is temple from beginning to end. So let's take a look at the table of contents to introduce it. I have the chapter titles listed, and I'll mention one heading from each chapter that caught my attention. I found really descriptive as we go through it. Chapter one sets a tone with the title, Good News, a new creation has come. And the very first heading in this chapter is the Genesis creation, origin or organization. And it all flows out of that. Chapter two is there is a new Adam. And the heading that caught my attention was the last Adam solved the first Adam's death. So the death of Adam relates directly to the biblical promise of resurrection for God's people. And we'll get to that uh, a little bit more below. Chapter three is the temple of the heavens and earth, God's meeting place with man. The two headings that caught my attention is God, God rested in his temple and Eden and the garden, the first temple of the heavens and earth. Chapter four is the eras of the old covenant heavens and earth. Uh, the very first heading in this is the covenant eras from Adam to Christ. And you can substitute the word ages in there as well, because I think that's what he communicates. Chapter 5, the passing of the old heavens and earth. Uh, the heading there that interested me was the old covenant heavens and earth have passed away. What now? And that leads logically right to chapter 6. The new heavens and new earth are now. And, of course, that the heading in that title, in that chapter, uh, that got my attention was the new heavens and earth is a temple metaphor of the new covenant world. Chapter seven, a new kingdom, the new Jerusalem. Very interesting heading in that chapter would be the new Jerusalem is the new garden of Eden. Chapter eight, the father's house, God's temple family. And, uh, you know, the, he draws that out in a heading called the, the father's house, our heavenly family. Chapter 9, a new temple demands a new priesthood. And there's two parallel headings here, Christ's new priesthood and Christ's new covenant priests. And those are two related uh, ideas in that chapter. Chapter 10, a new priesthood demands a new law. And this is a fascinating, fascinating heading in this chapter titled Slaves versus Sons. In chapter 11 is the uh, concluding chapter with application. It says, living in the end or in the new beginning, the transforming effect of truth. And what I really appreciate is the honesty and starting point that Maurice gives to introduce the book. 
He says, my main aim for everything as temple is to communicate an overarching perspective of God's desire to fellowship with his children. God's great patience and grace have touched me and his ceaseless wisdom never ceases to amaze me. The scriptures for me have become a bottomless chest of priceless treasures. The more I dig, the more I find. The higher I climb, the more mountain is revealed. In 2016 through 2020, I underwent a reformation in my understanding of the scripture, which in turn revolutionized my relationship with my heavenly father. I went from being a servant of God to a son of the heavenly father. Before that, my spiritual life had been narrow focused and wholly revolved around end times events, which I now call specious speculations and fantastical fear mongering of what was supposedly about to happen at any time. I was unaware that those last day events had already been fulfilled in the time of the early church and in the first century AD, as had been predicted by Jesus, attested to by his apostles and witnessed to some extent in the historical record. With the fulfillment of these events in the past, the Lord had long ago opened the gates of the new Jerusalem that we may enter into that city from that time, even now. That is an awesome place to work from. It is honest and sincere as far as a personal explanation. It resonates with me. This theology is not limited to academic study or theological treatises. This kingdom understanding has many applications that spill out all over real life and practice while we live in the world, reflecting the glory of God as we serve and minister gospel life to those around us. And the final chapter of the book focuses on that practical application, outworking. Maurice continues the idea that became his book. I could see the beautiful interweaving of the two concepts, fulfilled eschatology and temple typology. This led me to exclaim, everything is temple. This book is an attempt to make it a little easier for you to see these things and rejoice with me in their fulfillment. The worshipful flavor and spirit of awe comes out all over the book as you read it. Maurice gets right into the job in front of him with this key understanding at the outset of the book. It is also clear to me that the Genesis account was not intended to be a scientific record. This was a big breakthrough for me considering that I had been taught that the Bible was a scientifically accurate book. In fact, I have seen several inst instances where Christians who disagreed with that opinion were labeled as heretics, unbelievers, and generally mocked. However, I am sharing my journey of understanding this wonderful revelation of God that we call the Bible, and I must go where I see the scriptures lead, even though many disagree. Well, I'm going to highlight a few of the key concepts in the book that are relevant to the subject of covenant creation here on this channel. This means that there are worthy details and topics in the book, which I will bypass along the way. But those other topics and subjects are very helpful. And I'd refer you to the other reviews on Amazon if you'd like to see a more of a variety of topics discussed. The first issue that I noticed is one key point often overlooked in these discussions is that temple is a physical symbol of something else. The book of Hebrews calls the whole worship system of the Old Testament a shadow, and we all know that a shadow isn't the reality. A shadow is created by the reality, which comes only in Christ. In Futurist Theology, as promoted by G.K. Beale and many others, the physical tabernacle and temple in the Old Testament is a symbol of the material creation the physical heavens and earth, supposedly the topic in Genesis 1, regardless if you read it literally or more symbolically. Now think this through. If the temple is only a symbol, so the argument goes in books like this, then just as the temple was destroyed when it reached its designed end or goal in AD 70 for covenant history, so will the physical universe be destroyed at the final eschaton or telos of world history. So one covenant end related to the temple symbol foreshadows the coming final end of the world. 
So eschatological events from 8070 are typological of the coming end of the material universe and physical universe according to the common form of traditional futurism. Some call 8070 a dress rehearsal for the full eschaton at the end of the physical world. And you can understand that logic, but here's the key. If the temple is merely a symbol, then its destruction in AD 70 cannot be the full and final end of the world in that view. And it's a very popular view that gets one thing right, the temple is only a symbol, but comes to the wrong conclusion. The Bible describes the physical universe destruction in places like 2 Peter 3 and the book of Revelation. So this one issue shows why getting the biblical meaning of Genesis 1 correct is crucial to the preterist view. If you hold to Genesis 1 as describing the origin of the physical universe, and if the temple is a symbol of the Genesis 1 creation, then, uh-oh, you see the problem? 8070 would then be only the typological end and not the final end. The symbol is not the reality. So a lot of preterist critics of covenant creation haven't really thought this through, but Maurice Rogers handles the issue well. This explanation helps to illuminate why preterists who believe in the complete fulfillment of Bible prophecy in the first century need to think very carefully about their views of Genesis 1 through 3. The pattern of Eden, Sinai, and sanctuary, the elders on the mountain, the people of God in Eden, and the priests of God in the holy place of the Moses sanctuary are all shown to be of the same pattern. The people at the foot of the mountain were the covenant earth who were to be instructed in the knowledge of God, which corresponded to the courtyard in Moses sanctuary. The sanctuaries of Moses and Solomon were patterned after the spiritual heavens and earth. And that's just one way of saying that the tabernacle and temple are symbols of the spiritual heavens and earth. And now this view can be summed up by saying that the tabernacle and temple is a symbol of the old covenant introduced beginning with Genesis 1-1 to make it very, very simple. So what does the destruction of the temple in AD 70 signify? Well, in that view, it signifies the end of the old covenant creation because as Maurice says, the sanctuaries of Moses and Solomon were patterned after the spiritual heavens and earth. And it's absolutely crucial for preterists to understand the symbolism of the temple in the connection between Genesis 1 through 3 and temple theology, as is now understood and very well documented in current Genesis studies. And I can just hear the critics of covenant creation responding to this by saying, oh, you guys are just making this stuff up. Genesis 1, the old covenant creation, that's ridiculous. Well, is it? Note what Hebrews 9, 8 through 9 actually says. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place was not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. Did you get that? In the discourse in Hebrews 9, the writer demonstrated that the old covenant temple was symbolic of the then present age. And by the way, that also explains why the writer of Hebrews references Genesis 1 creation as the creation of the ages, plural, in Hebrews 1, 2 and Hebrews 11, 3. Genesis 1 introduced the old covenant creation, not the physical universe and material creation. So according to Hebrews, Genesis 1 is the creation of of the ages, and the temple is a symbol of this age. And by the way, the firmament detail in Genesis 1 also confirms this. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for seasons and for days and years. Genesis 1.14. The word used in the Genesis narrative for seasons is the Hebrew moed which in other places in the law is rendered as appointed feasts or appointed times, which were the temple feast days and the Sabbaths, which Israel was commanded to observe. Maurice continues, 
and let them be for light in the firmament of the heavens to give light to the earth. And it was so, Genesis 1, 15. The lights in the firmament divide the day from the night and gave light to the earth. The priest in the holy place of the sanctuary performed the function of being lights to Israel, teaching them the law and the prophets, making distinctions between day and night. That is what was right and wrong clean and unclean according to the old covenant law i have a video on this channel in the 2024 covenant creation curriculum series that is titled the eschatology of the firmament which elaborates on this eschatological dimension of the firmament in this temple context the firmament is the barrier between heaven and earth in the old covenant creation and the double veil in the holy place makes up the firmament in the tabernacle and temple symbolism. This is the firmament, the barrier between God and his people that is finally removed in the finished work of Jesus Christ at the end of the age. Jesus becomes the way into the Holy of Holies in the new heavens and new earth. So link in the description if you'd like to take a look at my video on it. The eschatology of the firmament is also a planned upcoming presentation at the 2025 Montana conference titled The Eschatology of Genesis. And I'll plan on developing that further because the firmament in Genesis 1 is a prominent element in the book of Revelation. So stay tuned for that. But Maurice gets it exactly right in his book. The temple as symbol of the old covenant creation is one key topic in his book. The second issue that jumps out at me from Everything is Temple is how Maurice presents the unfolding of the covenant view of creation and biblical history, beginning with Adam in the story. It makes sense that Adam was head of humanity in covenant with God. So when Adam sinned, he also ruined it for God's people, and there came a need for new heads of the covenant. And there's a chart on page 95, the old covenant, heavens and earth age. He says, after Adam failed, God established his covenant with Noah, Abraham, Moses, and finally with Christ. In Adam and in Christ are covenant relationships to God within separate and distinct covenant ages. This is the covenant headwaters that form the river of biblical history. And the details tie the whole story together. Therefore, when we see Adam's son, Abel, making a sin offering, that is another puzzle piece to the big picture. Abel made a sin offering, indicating he was in covenant with God. He was covenantally in Adam as a priest in the Eden temple, making an offering for the removal, or we could say covering, of sin. So the story of Abel as the faithful priest and first martyr of the Old Covenant brings the whole story together when we arrive at the eschatological teaching of Jesus. Commenting on Matthew 23, 34 through 36, Maurice explains it this way. Incidentally, Jesus indicated that the crimes of apostate Israel included the murder of Abel. This is another puzzle piece which shows that the Old Covenant world began with Adam and extended to Israel, culminating with a judgment in 70 AD. It is amazing how I had read these declarations for many years. You had completely missed their clear meaning. So the link between Abel's blood guilt and Israel's judgment bring the creation context of the Old Covenant into full view. And I should add that Jesus had just declared the religious leaders to be snakes and brood of vipers. Those are Genesis 2 and 3 details in that same passage of Matthew 23. So there are multiple links back to the first four chapters of Genesis in Matthew 23. And how does Jesus apply the blood guilt of Abel to this generation of Israel in Matthew 23 if the old covenant did not exist? in Genesis 1 through 4. So really what I'm saying here is that Jesus shows that the old covenant began with Adam. And furthermore, doesn't Paul also discuss his doctrine of resurrection from the context of Adam? 
indicating the same Old Covenant context as Jesus in Matthew 23. Another detail in Maurice's book, since we're talking about covenant creation, is the new covenant creation we find in the New Testament scriptures. He says, the creation of the new heavens and new earth occurred during the Messianic era. The Genesis creation week served as a pattern for the new creation. Each day of the new creation can be seen playing out in the New Testament scriptures. At the end of the new creation week, the new covenant world was ready to function. And to Maurice's great insight there about the big picture of the New Testament being a new creation week with a new heavens and earth being formed and organized, you could also see this in miniature with the ministry of Jesus Christ, because the ministry of Jesus Christ opens with a creation week. From the Gospel of John 1, 1 through John 2, 21, 2, 21 you'll see how this plays out. You'll notice that um, John 1, 1 opens with, in the beginning, a clear reference to Genesis 1, 1. And then John discusses light and darkness and what it means to be children of God, because the idea there is creation is about a people. And many see the obvious creation motifs here, but there is much, much more. In fact, the entire creation pattern continues with a creation week in the opening of the Gospel of John. The text literally says that Jesus did call his disciples, and then the next day, and then the next day, leading to the wedding at Cana, matching day six in John 2.1. This is amazing because John actually has days in sequential order that match the creation week of Genesis 1. And Gen in John 2, and it says the next day we come to a Passover, which is, of course, a high Sabbath day. That's the seventh day of rest, where we find what is being declared in John 2.21. 20, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. So there, there it is, the new temple in Jesus Christ at the conclusion of the creation week at the opening of the Gospel of John. This is remarkable temple theology merged with new creation motif patterned after Genesis 1 in John 1.1 1, 1 through John 2.21. And I'll lay all the details of that out soon in an upcoming episode in the Covenant Creation Curriculum. And that takes us to the last subject in this book. And I want to cover this one kind of in depth. This is, in my mind, the most significant detail of all. Maurice lays out a self-conscious covenant context for Adam and the redemptive fulfillment in Christ combined. This view, which I have seen discussed in various places online, has never been put into print before, at least to my knowledge. So this is truly historic. The subject of Adam and covenant context, which I plan to speak a lot about in the upcoming part four of my curriculum series on this site, all by itself makes this book a monumental first. Nobody has ever even attempted to put the Adam story in covenant context, complete with the dimension of fulfillment in Christ, in the same pages. In a formal publication, as far as I am aware of, what am I referring to? Well, apply covenant context to the beginning, just as preterists apply covenant context to the end. So congratulations, Maurice. You are the first one to do it in print. Now watch how he does it. The Apostle Paul indicated that there are two covenant heads of God's people. The first covenant head was Adam, and the second was Christ. The first man was from the earth, a man of the dust, the second man is from heaven, 1 Corinthians 15, 47. Through the sin of Adam, the death came to all covenant humanity. There was no high priest to obtain the removal of Adam's sin. So this puts Adam and Jesus as two parallel covenant men. Adam is the head of the old covenant creation, and Jesus is the head of the new covenant creation. See how balanced that is? The same context applies to both, and the covenant context is the basis for the parallel in Paul's teaching. 
Now watch how Maurice develops that thought. We know that the first man refers to Adam. If Adam was the absolute first man ever, then the second man should be Cain. Therefore, the first man is not a reference to the absolute first man, but the first covenant man, Adam. Likewise, the second man is the second or new covenant man, Christ. My proposition, therefore, is that Adam initially was of the dust from the existing human population, and God breathed on him the spirit of life. Let that sink in for a moment. The ramifications of understanding covenant context are huge. Have you ever thought about the possibility that Adam is the beginning of the old covenant creation, the first heavens and earth? How might that impacts some discussion going on today in preterism. You know, there are a few preterists to arrive at universalist conclusions regarding salvation for all human beings on planet Earth. What is the source of their universalism? Well, it is sourced in their universalist view of Adam, who supposedly brought the whole world under the old covenant. Do you see the train coming if you're a preterist? The old covenant has passed away. My view is very simple. Predator's universalism is one logical result of the failure to apply covenant context to Genesis creation. Adam is the first covenant man. Jesus is the second covenant man. Acknowledging that basic fact would end modern preterist universalism. And I should add here that something like Maurice is suggesting with covenant context at least for Adam and Eve, is currently being suggested in recent scholarship by writers such as N.T. Wright and John Walton and a few others. Here's Wright's explanation. This is where I sense a strong parallel with the calling and vocation of the ancient people of Israel. And this is where we might get glimpse some fresh light on Adam and the question of origins. Genesis itself makes a clear parallel between Adam and Abraham. Be fruitful and increase in number, Genesis 128, becomes, I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, Genesis 17, 6. It all sounds very, very familiar. And it leads to my proposal that just as God chose Israel from the rest of humankind for a special, strange, demanding vocation, so perhaps what Genesis is telling us is that God chose one pair from early hominids for a special, strange, demanding vocation. Call them Adam and Eve, if you like. You see the logic of what N.T. Wright says there? We see this pattern develop in the Bible. Let me work it backwards to the source. So just as Israel was called out to be a priestly people among the nations, and Abraham is called out from Mesopotamia to be the father of circumcision, Noah is called out of the ungodly world in order to bring salvation in his day. So Adam is called out to be the first priest of God in the ancient Near East world. This is the new historical Adam covenant view. And there are actually other preterist teachers that are starting to warm up to some basic details that look very familiar. Some teach that the Melchizedekian priesthood was given to Adam in the garden, was passed on to Abel, Seth, his sons, and then given to all the patriarchs going forward, including Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through Moses. We can't prove that, but I see it as a strong possibility. And I think the priest may have been the firstborn of the family. You know, in the very beginning, the Melchizedekian priest, the firstborn of the family was the priest. For that family let me show you this numbers 312 behold i've taken the levites from among the people of israel instead of the firstborn so in other words the firstborn used to be priests but now i'm taking the levites to be the priests i think the melchizedekian priesthood began with adam and it continued until the levitical priesthood was given at sinai i think this because again there's only two priesthoods mentioned in the Bible. 
If you want to examine that detail further, please see the episode in the curriculum series on this channel titled Adam, the First Priest, link in the description. Adam is God's first priest. And what is the purpose of a priest in the Bible? The purpose of God's priest in the Bible is to represent other people to God and priests represent God to other people. So Adam, as the first priest, would have a solemn job to minister and serve others around him and bring them into the knowledge of God. That's the whole point of being God's priests. The story in Genesis 4 says that Cain was banished to the land of Nod, where he found a wife and he built a city. In fact, he fears for his life when he is driven from the earth of the covenant people. Who is Cain afraid of? Well, he was afraid of somebody. And if there were others out there besides the covenant family of Adam, then the priestly ministry of Adam was for evangelistic purposes. Adam is the light in that dark world to bring the knowledge of God to those around him. Adam is the first type of Jesus. So the covenant context of Adam in Genesis as God's first priest really makes the most sense when joined with the covenant context of resurrection in biblical prophecy. And here's the key that Maurice brings to put it all together. In Christ, covenant humanity was lifted from the status where Adam had fallen to the place where Jesus is, in the Father's presence. You see how that works? Covenant context to the fall and covenant context to resurrection. Well, who is covenant humanity? Well, Hebrews 11, 1 through 40 gives us an explanation of covenant humanity. You notice Hebrews 11, verse 1 begins with faith. That's the defining characteristic of God's people of all ages. And then it goes into the creation of the ages in verse 3. That's the Genesis 1 creation being referenced in Hebrews 11, 3. So God's people of faith, beginning with Abel a listing from the Old Testament of history all the way through the, from, from Abel forward in verses 4 through 39 tells us who covenant humanity is. And then we have the conclusion in verse 40, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. The implication that Maurice draws out in the last few chapters is the reality of living in the new heavens and earth today. He says, when we were born of his spirit, we were resurrected and ascended to a heavenly position. The Apostle Paul wrote in, that in Christ, we are already seated on the throne with Christ as priests of the Most High God. These are not physical locations, but spiritual and covenantal roles and functions. The throne represents authority and dominion. In Christ, priestly authority and dominion are bestowed to you. So the kingdom of priests was once established in Christ and now continues in his people, what we call the body of Christ. The biblical perspective of fulfilled eschatology encourages believers to embrace a mindset of living in the new creation, as opposed to the traditional view of living in the last days. This shift of perspective profoundly impacts our approach to life, goals, and challenges as children of God and kingdom citizens. Well, the last chapter of Everything is Temple offers a stunning discussion about the power of this paradigm shift, along with some neat observations. The collective scriptural and historical narrative shows that the parousia of Christ in AD 70 was an event of universal paradigm shifting importance. The old heavens and earth of the covenant people of God passed away. It is mind-boggling that the majority of modern Christians haven't the slightest idea of this pivotal period in the history of mankind. God has inaugurated a new creation of his covenant people, making a new heaven and an earth for his new Adam. The kingdom of heaven has come. The sons of God have been revealed. Wow! The implications of this are extraordinary. I offer a hearty amen to that. The story of Adam, God's son, 
carries on today in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came from heaven. So, brothers and sisters, this is all your story now. Everything is temple. Stretched my thinking. It challenged me in new ways, and it will do the same for you. Are people ready for this today? No, <laughs> they're probably not ready for it yet, but that's okay. Go buy this book and start the conversation with those around you. You won't regret it. This is Tim Martin from Covenant Creation on YouTube saying goodbye until next time. Blessings.